Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. If you, uh, if you have your Bibles today, we're going to be in uh, in Luke, and um, the book is page uh, thirty nine, uh, and the scriptures begin on forty. And uh, the, uh, the title of the lesson today, if you look on 39 there, is The Identity of Jesus. And uh, this is based on um, some scriptures we're going to read where Jesus poses the question to the disciples. He says, um, you know, who do you think I am? And there's a lot to that question, right? Because um, we know what some people are going to answer and uh, what some people are going to have trouble answering about Jesus and what what's causes some people to get stuck um, and the attitudes that will cause you to um, misunderstand uh, the expectations that you might have that, that that we forced upon God expecting things from God that are not of God and we're supposed to be able to uh, oh thank you <laughs> we're supposed to be able to differ- differentiate between what we want and what God wants and, and to make sure that one is supreme over the other so, um, looking at this lesson here, um, we're going to start in uh, Luke 9 and uh, verse 18. But the, uh, the main thing I want to um, make sure we notice here is the, the, is the different um, attitudes toward Jesus and how it, how it causes people to act differently even. Not only just how, they, how we accept him, but, but how people act toward him. So let's pray first and we'll, we'll get into it. Lord God, we're so thankful to, for this day. We're thankful to you to be able to come together to read your word and to study it. I ask, Father, this morning that you will uh, remove me from the way and, and let everything that your Holy Spirit wants to have heard be heard here today in this, in this congregation. And we ask, Father, that you will continue with us throughout the service, be with those who are here to sing for us, here to preach for us, here to teach for us, and be with all those who are here to listen and to learn as well, Father. And We ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, so we're going to be in um, Luke chapter 9, and let's see, I was thinking about starting a little earlier than they had, but um, mm, yeah, let's do, start in the 18 here. So we see, let's read the 18 through... Uh, through 20 here. So he says, And it came to pass, as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him, and he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? They answering said, John the Baptist. But some say Elias, and others say that one of the old prophets is risen again. He said to them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, The Christ of God. And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing. Uh, so this, these scriptures are a direct um, questioning from Jesus to the disciples. Uh, and it's two things, really. It's, first of all, his identity. What is my identity? What, who am I is the most basic question, right? And um, when we are looking at this, we're looking at a, a, the question of Jesus being, are you, are, am I someone you're going to follow? Am I someone you're going to follow for the right reasons? And am I someone you're going to follow uh, with a dedicated following? And uh, to follow Jesus is a big thing. We see, this, we see this phrase a lot. We say it a lot, right? To follow. But what does follow mean? I had to look this up in the dictionary, but the, first, the very first uh, definition is to move behind someone or something, go where he, she, or it goes. And we, we, uh, we can see that in our daily lives when you say you get a, a dog that follows you home, right? He followed me. He went behind me. He went where I went. Or in a movie, somebody says, I think we're being followed. Somebody's behind us. Somebody's following, going where we go. And that's what follow is, right? But there's also another definition, to go in the same direction, like on a road or a path. To go in the same direction. And... Um, a good example of that, I think, is uh, follow the yellow brick road, right? That means go where the re- yellow brick road goes, and you'll get to Oz. And number three is to have great interest in something, or to watch it very closely. And we say that with, which football team do you follow? What sports do you follow? 
but also a celebrity is going to tell you, hey, follow me on Twitter, Facebook. It means to, to take an interest in me, take an interest in this, and, and to follow it, watch it closely. But we can see all of these things is the kind of following we're supposed to be doing to Jesus. Right. Right? We're supposed to go behind him and go where he goes. Right? Our great hope is to go where he, where he goes, where he is yeah. right now, right? But to go in the same direction, like on a road or a path, right? right? The narrow road. And to have a great interest or to follow something very closely. We should, as Christians, have a great interest in Jesus and the things that are written in his word. And we should watch closely. So um, when we look at these verses then, we see that, that uh, they are alone praying just him and the disciples, when he asks him this first question, who, whom say the people that I am, in verse 18. So here we, have, we can say that Jesus doesn't have any doubt who he is. Right? This is not him asking for their confirmation, right? He knows who he is. So this is not a question of the fact. This is a question of, of perception and belief. And this is the setup that Jesus gives them for the very next question. And he's going to create a contrast between what the people are saying about him and what the uh, disciples are going to say about him. And that, that, uh, that is still a question that we ask ourselves today. Um, what's the crowd say about Jesus? What's the world say about Jesus? What is the popular opinion of Jesus? And what do we think of Jesus? And there's a difference, right? Jesus wants the disciples to, to understand the difference. First, that, that what, Jesus, what the world says about Jesus is... Um, Almost never the truth. And that's, that's still the question, right? And you know, some people today still will say, you know, I like what Jesus said, but I don't think he was God. I don't think he has this power that he's supposed to have. They say that um, Jesus is a philosopher. He's a wise philosopher. And he says a lot of things that are uh, good advice, right? But that's true. Jesus was a wise philosopher. He is a wise philosopher. But he's much more than that. Look in Matthew 13, 54. We're told that when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch as they were astonished, and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? So when he goes to teach in the synagogues, he's so wise that people are, they fall back a little bit because he's, they're amazed, astonished, it says, by how wise he is. And 1 Corinthians 1, 30 says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God made, us unto, made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So see, if we, if we deny the last three and say that Jesus is just wisdom, a lot of people are wise. A lot of people here today are wise, in my estimation. But wisdom is not just all that Jesus brings. right? We see that in, in that verse there. Wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. He's all those things together, and no other man has been that. That's his, his alone. So to say he's just a, a wise philosopher, that doesn't cover it, does it? We wouldn't fo follow just a wise philosopher. We wouldn't do the things we do for Christ that we would for just somebody who's wise. And we see that um, <clears throat> uh, when the disciples respond, we get, we get a, a, a good look at what people do think about Jesus in that time. They say he's a prophet. And that's true. They weren't wrong on that. He is a prophet. Prophets help bring the will of God around to mankind. But he's not just a prophet. No, any more than he's just a philosopher. If you look at Hebrews 1 and 1, we see this. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also... He made the worlds. So this is a very uh, close um, uh, answer to this, this question that was, that's been raised. Uh, is Jesus a prophet, or is he more than that? Well, Hebrews 1, 1 tells us, you had prophets before, now you have the Son. Who, who, does, who does prophesy, but he is the Son of God. He's greater than that. He's more than that. If we just say that he's just a prophet, like some people were thinking back then, Right? Not the prophet, but not the Messiah, that's not enough. That's not who Jesus is. They were wrong about that if they just stopped there. And then, of course, some people said at the time that Jesus was just a liar, 
that he was making all this up. And we have people, a lot of people today, that believe that as well, don't they? That he's making all this up. He's a fraud. And people at this, in the uh, ancient times, they had, a, they had some reasons to think this. Because he wasn't the Messiah they, they thought they wanted. He didn't do the things that were popularly uh, ascribed to what the Messiah was going to do. And he didn't bow down to the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees the way that they expected the Messiah would do. So they said, he's a liar. But you know, the man, the man Jesus, doing the things that he did, was fulfilling all the prophecies. And his humility did not, did not mean that he was going to bow down to the scribes and the Pharisees and do what they said. His humility was before God, not before the priests. If you look in 1 John 22, we are told exactly the opposite of what the world will tell you. It says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So what is the lie? That Jesus is not the Christ. That Jesus is not the Son of God. That he is just a man. That's the lie. And people still, still will say this about Jesus today. You know, these people want... Uh, they want the blessed assurance of a spirit-filled life, all the, all the good things that it comes with following Jesus, but um, they don't like this or that thing. I'm offended by this thing in the Bible, or I don't like that it says that in the Bible. So they would reject him and his, and his truths. And that happened thousands of years ago, it happens today, and it will continue to happen. Uh, that's how people are. People are going to put themselves before Jesus, right? Not following after, but expecting Jesus to follow after them. Not, not the following after the things that Jesus says, but expecting Jesus to follow after the things that we say. Hey, I don't like this in the Bible. Well, the Bible was here before me, and the wisdom of the Bible was here before anything. So therefore, uh, it's, I should follow after it. That's right. right. Just because of that, I should follow after it. But people are going to refuse to follow, refuse to go after what is uh, written in the Bible. And if you look in verse 19, we see some of the misinterpretations that the disciples had, or that they were talking about that the people had, rather, uh, said that he was uh, Elias, which is Elijah. That's the Greek for Elijah. Uh, and uh, people misunderstood. They thought Jesus is Elijah. He's been <laughs> raised from the dead and come back to, to teach us. If you look in Malachi 4 and 5, this was probably uh, the verse that they were looking at says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So people that misunderstood, we can say at least one thing about them, is that they had read some of the scriptures. They were probably looking at things like this and misinterpreting, misunderstanding what Jesus' mission was. <clears throat> And then some people said that Jesus was John the Baptist. The, the disciples are, are, are telling us that some people believe that he was John the Baptist raised from the dead. And that's, um, you know, in, in, uh, if we didn't know anything else about Jesus, we might make that mistake too. But because um, John, when he came, came teaching, his teaching and life were very aligned with what Jesus was like. He was very much like him. People thought that Jesus was John then. Raised from the dead, not knowing that he was a greater, greater thing than John. And you know, John would have fulfilled some some prophecies. He had a miraculous birth. Uh, he was a wise preacher and a wise teacher. And he was executed for the message that he brought for Christ. But you know, John fulfilling kind of sorta of, some prophecies, that's not enough. That's not even close to enough. We have faith in a man that fulfilled all of the prophecies, brought all of God's promises to fruition, brought all of those with him. And we know then that he is the Son of God. That's how they should have known. That's how we should know he is the Son of God. Not because of a, a, a few prophecies, but that he fulfilled all the prophecies. If you see a prophecy in the Bible of the Messiah, you will find a place where Jesus fulfills it. He fulfills all of them. And then some of the promises of old... Uh, have yet to come about, but Jesus still fulfills them. He is still ready. He is still waiting. And he is still, uh, at the Father's words, going to fulfill everything. 
Let's look at uh, 20 and 22 of, of Luke 9. This is the question. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, The Christ of God. And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. So he says unto the disciples here, he, he asks them to um, confess their own beliefs. This is, this is the invitation. So we understand now, what does the world say about me? That's, that's already been spoken. We know that now. But Jesus says, you understand that now. Now, now you've got to show, are, are you, do you have faith in the world who says I'm a liar, a philosopher, a, a, just a prophet? Or do you believe me who says I am the Son of God, I am the Son of Man? And you, you get that choice, just as they did. And Jesus was uh, kind and merciful to set it up this way. You know, those who think Jesus is just another prophet, they, they had no excuse because he said, I'm the Son of God. He said he's more than just a prophet. And um, he cannot be just a prophet then. And people who thought he was John the Baptist raised from the dead, they had no excuse either because John did not fulfill the prophecies and promises of God. And in fact, um, uh, John is, um, says himself, you look in John 1.25, he denies him, even himself that, uh, that he is the Christ. It says, And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He, he it is who coming after me is preferred before me whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. And that's interesting what he says there in 27. He who's coming after me, meaning showing up on the scene after me, he is before me, right? He follows me chronologically. I follow him spiritually, right? It's the same with us today. Christ's ministry was a long time ago. Uh, and we follow after him both chronologically and spiritually. And his existence has been since before time was time. And we, we come after him in that way as well. So when John answers, he, he actually denies that himself. And you know, people that thought he was Elijah, they saw some of the scriptures about Elijah, things that Elijah was declaring, and they, they made a mistake there. But there was pressure on them, wasn't it? There's always pressure on you. The devil puts pressure on you to deny these things, deny the miracles of Jesus and say, oh, that was just coincidence to deny the power of Jesus and say, uh, I'm going to live today like uh, he's not the Christ. And, and that's the pressure the devil will put on you. And we're going to see Jesus gives us uh, advice on how to, how to get past that, how to get through that. If you look in verse 21, he straightly charged them, we see. And he strictly, in command, he strictly commanded them. He was very direct about it. That's what it means that he straightly charged them. He wasn't, there was no deception in it at all. He straightly charged them. He directly he directly commanded them, don't tell anybody. And that's, this is something that we have to, to look at and wonder about and, and, and uh, read the Bible and, and try to understand it. Why would he command them not to tell people? And this came up during our Bible study a little while back in Matthew's uh, rendition of this. Um, but we, we can't underestimate the, the powerful sentiment among the people at the time. Uh, they were looking for a Messiah who was going to conquer the whole world. Uh, they were looking for uh, freedom from Rome and the bondage that they were in. They were desperate for any hope at all from God. So even when they took, had even the smallest taste of that kind of hope, uh, they would run here and there, all over the place, following any false prophet that said, oh, it's me. They were eager for for the rewards, they were not eager for the Messiah. They were eager for the things that the Messiah was promised to give them, not eager for the Messiah himself. And that's where they were blinded about it. And we see in the John 6, 14, that some of them even tried to grab Jesus and force him to be king. And John 6, 14 says, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force... To make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. So 
There's a reason Jesus says this. I think it's very close to, to that. Uh, but, you know, Jesus did not come into the world to bring the things that they were looking for, the material rewards that they were looking for, but he did bring what they were needing. That is, he was a conqueror. He conquered the grave. He was one to free them from bondage. He freed all of us who accept him from bondage of sin, Amen. spiritual bondage. And, you know, people that were so, so thirsty for just any little good thing from God, Jesus also fulfills that, that, that fountain of life that is everlasting. He will fulfill that as well. Because, see, the people were looking for a different kind of Messiah than the one that they had. And in verse 22, we see that Jesus is, gives a prophecy about himself. And this is the first one in, in Luke, and we have six times in Luke that he says this to, to the disciples. The Son of Man must suffer, be rejected, and be slain, and be raised. He tells them all of this. He tells them the whole story right there. And he prophesies that he's going to suffer, that he's going to die, that he will be raised again. And it, was, it was a shock to the disciples. It had to be. because they just, they, just, they just witnessed uh, and probably participated in Peter's confession, you are the Son of God. To hear then that He's going to be rejected. He's going to be shamed. He's going to be killed. You know, they, they, uh, they were challenged. Jesus gave them a challenge here. Uh, and it's a challenge that he gives to you and me today still. Like if we can't get past the first couple of things that he said and make it to the end, if we don't read to the end, <laughs> we won't understand. It's like any, any book that you read. Like if you read every other page or something and, and stop halfway through, you're not going to know what it's about. Read it to the end to know what it's about. And this is what Jesus was asking them to do. Go to the end of what I said. That's where the hope is. The hope in Jesus is not suffering. It's not being slain. It's not being crucified. It is that he was raised again. That he was willing to go to the cross is significant, but the cross itself is not anything. It's that he died and that he was raised. That is what we have faith in. That's what we have joy in. And that's what our Messiah gave to us a much greater thing than if he had just, if he had conquered Rome and took the Romans out of the way, right. it'd be in a history book somewhere. It probably wouldn't affect us much at all. Right. But the things that he did do affects everybody every day. So we see he, why he was so much greater than what people thought he was. And he challenged them, don't, don't, uh, don't let yourself be... Uh, stymied by the first few things, look at the last thing, the resurrection. And that fulfills all the prophecies. The suffering is prophecy. The crucifixion is prophecy. But also the resurrection is prophecy. He says, believe the prophecies, believe me, and know that the things that I tell you are true, and that the resurrection is true. And this is not a single resurrection of himself, but he's the first of many resurrections to be made to life eternal. So that is something that he wanted this, the disciples to understand and the people and everybody to understand. His, uh, his mission from the Father was, was not uh, to uh, conquer in this or that country or to give some prophecies for the next one to come. It was all about Jesus and his, his mission was to save the world from sin. So if we look in 23 through 26, the rest of this part says, And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. So here is another challenge that he gives, Jesus gives to him. You know, he, he destroyed the, the hope of a Messiah who was just here to conquer a country. The, the, the expectation that Jesus was just here to bring a worldly rewards, uh, you know, freedom from Rome, freedom from whatever uh, problems you're having. Uh, but the earthly rewards that they were thinking he was here, that, that here for, that couldn't compare even to the rewards that he actually brought. And Jesus is not just uh, an insurance policy against judgment, against hell. You know, we don't just uh, 
uh, sign a, a document and put it in our back pocket just in case something happens and, and you know, we, we are cast into eternity and, oh, oh, I got the insurance policy. Pull it out. That's not going to work. And there are probably a lot of people who believe that will work still today. But, you know, we don't, uh, we long for not um, that, that, kind of, that kind of assurance, but the better assurance that he brings, you know. We come to him uh, because we long for him. We, we long to see his promises fulfilled because they glorify God when that happens. And we are supposed to come to Jesus. We're not supposed to come uh, to the altar for a specific church or don't come to the altar for some charismatic leader tells you to. Don't go to uh, the altar over a denomination or for a philosophy, as you believe. We go to the, the altar, we go to the cross for him. We trust in him. That's what it's all about. And he makes this clear when he says this. He says, take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross. And to the disciples at the time, that was probably pretty difficult for them to, to understand or to even hear, because there had been people before uh, Jesus had been crucified. This is how it got popular, because Romans found that this is an effective way to get rid of somebody, to destroy what they were saying, and to uh, make people uh, forget about them. The Romans had done this many times to people. So people, the disciples would have known right then that the things that were involved in the cross, at least a little bit, you know, they still they had before Jesus this procession going up to the place where he, you would be killed. You had to carry your own cross. You had to be shouted at and jeered at and humiliated. And when you have your cross in hand, going up that hill, following Jesus, just like him, you can't take any stuff with you. It takes both hands to carry that cross. You can't take your stuff with you. And that's what Jesus said. He said, deny yourself. And denial is, a, is an interesting concept. You, you know, uh, it, it, um, it suggests that there's a want, that there's a desire, right? We don't deny ourselves things that we don't want. Right. We deny ourselves things that we greatly want, things that, that we greatly, greatly desire. And Jesus says, you know, you, your denial is that you must refuse to give in to the desires of the flesh, to the things that the world is telling you about me, that I'm a liar, that I'm a, just a prophet, that I'm John the Baptist. He says, don't believe that. Deny that. Deny the, the devil's speaking in your ear and saying, he's not the Christ. Deny all of that. And don't give in to the flesh. They're going to corrupt you. Don't give in to the world. It's already been corrupted. And don't give in to the devil, because he has destroyed himself with the things that he tries to convince us day by day to engage in. Deny even yourself. And that's, hey, I'm the most important person to me, aren't I? Why would I deny myself? I have to live with myself. Right? But it's easy to deny others. It's hard to deny ourselves, isn't it? We are almost, uh, as a uh, fallen man, uh, more inclined to deny things from other people, but not to ourselves. It goes just the other way for ourselves, doesn't it? I, want to, I don't want to deny myself. I want to deny others. That's what the world tells us. And it's hard, then. It's hard to deny the flesh. It's hard to deny the temptations of the devil. But Jesus gives us that way to do it. And he says, he says deny yourself and take up your cross. And you know, it would be impossible to do that without him. And through his teaching, through his word, and through the Holy Spirit, that's the only way you can. And it's deny, not, not just deny ourselves good food, not deny ourselves comfortable clothes or housing or whatever. It's deny the most very basic things that the devil tries to get you to want. The desires that rise up in the flesh, whether it be long term or in the moment. Jesus gives us the commandment and the ability to deny those things to look past those things of the world into a, a more uh, beautiful reality, a more beautiful way to be. And if you look in 24, the last few verses here, 24 through 26, Jesus says, Whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Talking about being resurrected with him. 
And people who try to save themselves, try to grab and cling onto everything that they can in the world, try to hold on to it, that person will be lost. They will be unsaved. Uh, they will lose their chance at eternal life. They will be separated also from all the things that he tries to grab onto. All the things that the world promises. We have many, many parables of people who put all of their faith in worldly things, and it's all destroyed. It is all gone. I, I don't think I have to tell anybody here, the world is going away. The world is not everlasting. This world is going to go away. It's going to be pretty cataclysmic when it does, and it's going to be replaced by a new earth. And that's a promise that we can, uh, we can take uh, comfort in, more comfort than anything the world can give you is that comfort, that, that this world which is not constant, this life in the flesh which is not constant, the life in the spirit is eternal. And uh, Jesus says in 25, for what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? And there it is. What is the advantage of, of gaining everything in the world? If we ruled over the whole world, if we had everything at our very fingertips that we wanted, I would be an insufferable guy, first of all. But second of all, all that would go away. And when, when the flesh is stripped away and the world is stripped away, all you have is your faith, your confession, and uh, your works. And if we don't pay attention to those things, we won't have any hope in anything but the world, and, and we won't have any hope in anything eternal. And he says in 26, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory, and in his Father's, and of the holy angels. And uh, just think about that last part there. If uh, <clears throat> when Jesus comes, and we stand in his presence, there will be some who are ashamed, who were ashamed of him in life, now ashamed of themselves. Ashamed for passing by this offer of, offer of uh, salvation and to be ashamed before Jesus. It's going to be a terrible thing. I'm glad I escaped it. To be ashamed, not only in front of Jesus, look, it goes on. <laughs> to be ashamed of Jesus, the Son of Man will be ashamed of you. What's that mean? Well, we're, when we are ashamed of Jesus, we reject him, don't we? We cast him away. We say, I don't know anything about that guy. Right. When Jesus rejects you, it will be the same. Right. You will be rejected, you will be cast away, and Jesus will say, I never knew who you were. <clears throat> I didn't know you. And it's even an even greater shame in that day because it says to us in that last verse, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory. So not coming as this, uh, this, this man in the flesh, but coming in glory. You know, it would be shameful to, to uh, reject the man that was in the flesh. It's more embarrassing, more shameful to reject his glory, to be ashamed in his glory. Not only ashamed in his glory, in his Father's presence. Ashamed in the Father's presence. And of Jesus ashamed of us in the Father's presence. And the holy angels will be there too. The holy angels will be there not to increase... That's powerful because if you think about it, Jesus has the entire heavenly realm on him when he comes back. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's, that's a good um, thing for us to look forward to, right? If he's not ashamed of us in that day, that will be a glorious thing that he's there, that the Father's there, that he's in his glory, that the angels are there. But for, for the, uh, those who do not, it's a shameful thing. To be ashamed before all the hosts of heaven and God and the throne and everything. That's a pretty terrible thing. And uh, you know, there, there's a reason these are all here, because we have, we have uh, uh, promises in the Bible that there will be a judgment. Jesus will be here for the judgment. The Father will be there for the judgment. The angels will be there for the judgment. And the angels, part of the reason they're there is for those who, who have rejected Christ and who he rejects in turn. The angels will take you and throw you 
And that's, that's a, a more terrible part of a terrible thing. So, to be saved from that, that's a gift we should, we should honor every day. Every morning when we get up, you know, Jesus says, take up, your, take up your cross daily. If you look at those verses, he says daily. Not just once. Not just take up your cross once, then lean it up against something. Take it up daily. Every day that we get up is a new opportunity. Whatever we did yesterday, God's forgiven that through Christ. What we're going to do today is, are we going to follow him? Do we believe he is the Christ? If we believe he's the Christ, we will do the things that he says. And that's the bottom line. If we believe in him, we do the things that he says. We believe in everything about him, not just the things that the world tells us, not the things that the flesh tells us that he is, not the things that maybe we want to think that he is, but what he actually is. That's the only promise that we have, that Jesus is exactly what the Bible says he is. Not what any, any preacher says he is, not what any Sunday school teacher says he is, not what any person or organization or political movement, whatever it is, says about Jesus. If you look in the Bible and it's contradicted, you better get those people right or get away from them. Because <laughs> not, that's not the truth. And the truth is what he brought in, in these verses. Jesus is bringing them to an understanding of the truth, bringing them to an understanding of who he is. And I want to just look, if you look on the, the book on page 43, I think the very first point here is the best one that's been made. Uh, it says, uh, the question is specifically about Jesus. While that might seem obvious, it is important nevertheless to note because of the increasing prevalence of spirituality in our culture. So it talks about spirituality. And then um, <clears throat> if you look on, uh, let's see, page 44, sorry, 45, it says this again. Uh, at the very bottom on the left, Jesus' identity is validated. Jesus indeed made some outlandish claims about himself. He issued some crazy predictions about what would happen to him. He taught with an unbelievable authority that was so out of bounds that many considered it blasphemous. And yet all of his claims, teaching, and authority were validated. When he died, the exact death he predicted and then rose from the dead. And it says, apart from the cross and resurrection, we could and should dismiss the claims of Jesus. For if he could not be trusted on the issue of his own death and resurrection... How could we believe he was right about anything else? But because of the death and resurrection, Jesus not only made claims about his identity, he verified those claims. So we, we should not believe anybody that had said, had just fulfilled some prophecies, had just you know, done some nice things or, or been a good philosopher. We only trust him because he has proven himself to us, and he proves himself day by day. And so we uh, keep an eye on that because that, that, will, that will lift you up day by day to see how, how he renews his promises and enriches his promises for us every day. He is out every day doing the will of God. Let's be out every day doing his will. Let's pray and we'll stop there. Lord God, again, we're so thankful to be able to gather together to read your word and to study it. We're thankful, Father, for all those who could be here today. We know, Father, we have a lot of illness in our community. I just pray, Father, that, that we can lift those up to you, that your healing wings will descend and your amazing power will do your will in the lives of all those who are, who are sick. And we ask, Father, that you will just be with us through the rest of the service today. Lead us and guide us. Show us everything that you want to show us today so that we will be strengthened and armored up for when we leave here. We will be able to fight off the wiles of the devil and bring more back into your church to, to worship you, to know you the way that we do. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.